Previously, we've talked about how to use parametric equations to generate images for the scope. The basic idea being that you have two equations, one for defining the x location and another for the y location. And there's some other set of parameters that is used by both equations in order to draw things on the screen. These can be quite powerful for drawing certain kinds of images, but without any other techniques in our tool belt, we'll get a little boxed in if we wanted to draw some arbitrary shape that doesn't have a nice set of equations that represent its path around the screen. To demonstrate what I mean, let's draw a square using parametric equations. We could create two triangle waves like this, and we'd get a square that's rotated a bit. If we wanted it on its side instead, we could then clip it. Our equation is a bit more complicated than before, it's not just simply using sine and cosine, but you know, it's, it's still manageable. I can wrap my head around the entire equation at once without too much effort. It rapidly gets very unwieldy if we move beyond simple shapes like a square. Here's a bit of internet lore from over a decade ago that draws the Batman logo using this absolutely insane equation. Would you really want to implement this? What about this example where we have a bunch of connected points that randomly move around the screen? How would we even begin to come up with a parametric equation that can do that? Ridiculous examples aside, if we want to tackle these sorts of problems, we'll need new solutions. Something that I realized pretty quickly when I was first learning how to make oscilloscope music is that there's already a lot of resources out there on the many different ways of coding computer graphics. Instead of thinking in terms of audio, which generates graphics, it is quite a bit simpler to think in terms of graphics, which we can then turn into audio. Now, turning graphics into audio isn't trivial, but if we want to come up with methods to do this, it makes the job of creating oscilloscope music a lot easier. If we can do this, then we'll have a wealth of resources on creating graphics that we can just manipulate slightly, converting it into sound to draw on our scope. We'll be able to save ourselves quite a bit of work. When thinking about how images are displayed on our computer screens, generally speaking, there's two kinds of methods for telling the computer how to do it. Raster, also known as bitmap, and vector. Raster means that the image is made up out of pixels. Things like JPEGs and PNGs come to mind. This is of little use to us though, since on the scope, we're dealing with a dot we move around the screen. It doesn't really work like a raster. We could write code that works like raster graphics, but the other option, vector graphics, ends up being a much better fit. Instead of being defined by pixels, vector graphics are defined by points and paths. Things like PDFs and SVGs are some examples. So what we can do is borrow this idea from vector graphics and come up with a similar system using an array of points and linear interpolation to describe the paths between them. To demonstrate how this technique works, I'll keep using a square as the shape we want to draw for demonstration purposes. The process goes like this. First, we figure out where we want the points to be. So for our square, we can use the points negative one, 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 negative one, and negative one, negative one. We'll then store the points in an array so that we can access them later. Inside the array, the points have to be in order, either going around the square clockwise or counterclockwise. We'll get to why order matters in a moment. Now that we have our points, we'll use linear interpolation, or LERP for short, to get the points in between our corners and connect them. This is useful for all sorts of things, but in a nutshell, linear interpolation will given a percentage, calculate a new value in between two given values. For example, if I wanted to interpolate between the numbers 0 and 100 using linear interpolation, I could get any number in between the two, depending on the percentage I gave the LERP method. So when we give LERP two points on the square, we can use it to get a point in between them. We can then go through every pair of points in our array and draw every single point in between them. This allows us to reach every possible point on the square while only filling our array with the corners. Now that we have a basic understanding of what we want to do, let's take a look at how we can implement this in PD and Odyssey Studio. In PD, there's no point data type, so we'll create two arrays, one containing the X locations and another containing the Y locations. This is done using these various array objects. Array define creates an array with the name and size we provide. We can then use array set to fill the designated array with the values we want by passing it a message. Earlier, we figured out what those points should be, so we can go ahead and break those up into their x and y components and fill each array with the appropriate values. To read through all the points continuously, I'll use phase or tilde, which ramps from 0 to 1 and multiply it by the length of our array, which in the case of this square is 4, since we have 4 points. Now our phaser is ramping from 0 to 4. 
We can then feed the output from our phaser into tab read tilde and give it the name of our arrays so it knows which arrays to read from. Now we can see why the order of our points in the array matters. Phaser tilde is cycling through the points one at a time from start to finish. Once we start interpolating between the points, if we had them out of order, we'd get lines in the wrong places. In OSI Studio, it's much cleaner. We just create an array of points using the VEC3 class. No need to have two separate arrays. Our phase is this T parameter provided in the gen method, so we'll also multiply it by four and then cast it to an int so that we can index into the array. Then all we have to do is send whatever the point happens to be out to our scope. Now we haven't defined any of the paths yet, so we're just getting the points on the screen. Let's implement linear interpolation next. I haven't actually talked about what the equation for lerp is yet, just how it works, but scrolling through the relevant wiki page, we can find two equations that will do this for us. It looks like the first one has the potential to sometimes not work due to floating point errors, so we'll use the second one. In PD, there is no lerp object, so we'll have to make one ourselves. I'll just create a subpatch for this and put the equation we found on the wiki page into expert tilde. Now we'll need two of these, one for the array of x values and another for the y values. Next, we need to get the point after the one we're currently drawing so that we can interpolate between them and draw the edges of our square. To do this, we can just add one to the scaled output from our phaser, take that value mod 4, and then read from our arrays again. The reason we use mod 4 is so that we don't read past the end of the array and make sure to connect the last point to the first point. If we didn't, when our current point was the final point in the array, we'd add one to it and attempt to read the fifth index of our array, which doesn't exist. In PD, tab read tilde guards against this and just returns the last available value in the array. But in other languages, this is not guaranteed and all sorts of strange undefined behavior could happen. We also want to connect the last point to the first, so when we take this value mod 4, we'll be interpolating between the fourth index and the first index, completing the loop. We're still not getting lines though, and that's because we haven't provided lerp with the third input telling it how much to interpolate. All we have to do here is take the scaled output of our phaser and use wrap tilde, which is just mod 1 for signals, and plug that into our lerp subpatch. Now we're connecting all the points and drawing the square. This last bit might seem like magic, but I'll explain. The reason is that when we interpolate between each pair of points, lerp needs an interpolation amount from 0 to 1. To create a full line going from start to finish, we need to hit all the numbers between 0 and 1, otherwise we won't get a complete line. Additionally, we need this ramping to happen in sync with each pair of points. Since our scaled phaser goes from 0 to 4, if we use wrap tilde, which will return its input mod 1, we'll go from 0 to 1 four times. If I graph the two, the relationship is a bit clearer to see. In Aussie Studio, it's more or less the same. The only difference is that we have a VEC3 class, which cleans up the code quite a bit. And the Aussie Studio library contains a blend method, which interpolates between two points. So there's no need to roll our own like we did in PD. Otherwise, it's the same. We create and fill our array here at the top, scale our input phase, calculate our current and next index, get the two points, and then interpolate between them using mod 1 of our scaled phase. Now for tasks like these, where we want to draw a shape and connect the points, Aussie Studio has a nice little class called Path Recorder that will do all the work we just did for us. All we have to do is first include the header file. Then we can create a path and specify the number of points. If we're not going to change the points, then instead of calculating them in gen, we can just add them here in setup. Generating the path is as simple as calling the path's gen method inside of our overall gen function. Pretty simple, and we don't have to worry nearly as much about handling the arrays. In fact, if all we wanted to do was draw a square, we could just simply include the shapes header file and call square. Here's a simple variation where we control the amount of interpolation. Here's another one where instead of drawing a square, we fill the array with a bunch of random points instead. Something that is useful to know how to do is selectively not interpolate when we want to. That way we don't have to have every single point connected to each other. We can create another array, which will just be a series of zeros and ones. 
zero for no interpolation, one for interpolation. Since controlling the amount is as simple as scaling the output of wrap tilde, we can just read through interp with the main phaser and then use the values in interp to scale wrap tilde. Right now, interp is filled with all ones, so we get a complete square. But if any of these get set to zero, then the interpolation for the point at that index in the points array won't happen. This array of points plus interpolation method works great, but the problem quickly becomes, what are the points I want to fill my array with? It can become a bit unwieldy to program the logic we need to expand upon this idea completely in PD. As usual, when we're in Aussie Studio, all these sorts of problems PD has are non-issues. We get the full power of an actual programming language. I do prefer to work in PD though, so what I like to do instead is use this PDJS library that allows me to write scripts in JavaScript and then feed the output into PD. The script will do all the work of calculating where the points are and if I want to control the interpolation, when and where to turn it on and off. Here's some spaghetti I wrote that performs the marching squares algorithm. The JS script is doing all the work of calculating the points, as well as when to turn the interpolation on and off, and then it sends all that information out to PD. I won't explain how this whole thing works in detail, but I'll give a basic overview. Every time PD sends the script a bang message, this bang function will get called and start the marching squares algorithm. Then we go through these various for loops, which should definitely be refactored and put into their own functions. But anyways, we survive the spaghetti and eventually end up at these calls to outlet, which will send all the data we calculated to PD. From there, PD will update its arrays to the correct length to hold all the data, and then fill them with the points we calculated in the script. Then it's on to things we just learned how to do. PD reads through the array we just filled and uses linear interpolation to connect the points as desired. I ended up implementing this in C instead, because JS was just way too slow allowing me to create this cool demo where I took video from my webcam and displayed it on the scope. Anyways, the point I wanted to make was this. The algorithm I wanted to implement here was quite complicated, and doing it all in PD would have been quite laborious, and I'm almost certain it's verging on actually impossible. But this is very doable in JavaScript, and now PD is left to do things that it was actually designed for. Continuing with this idea of arrays of points and the paths that connect them, Next time, we'll take a look at how Aussie Studio uses the traveling salesperson algorithm to take 3D models from Blender and turn them into sound. It's surprisingly simple and allows us to leverage the full power of actual 3D modeling software.